Good day, friends. Uh, what a privilege again chatting to you. We are in phase four of our national um, lockdown, and I think for many people it's a frustrating time. Um, at least we have one positive uh, in, in the wine industry that from last Friday the 1st, actually from the 4th Monday, we were allowed to start exporting again. And I think most wineries have quite a bit of wine stacked up that's uh, been ordered on mailing lists that's ready to go and we're just waiting for the, the green light from the government. But currently it's a bit of a frustrating time. Just to give, give, to give you a bit of a heads up what's happening on the farm and what's happening in the cellar, I'm privileged to work with a, a skeleton staff and we're busy racking 2020 wines and preparing them for, in the case of white wine, for bottling. In uh, the case of red wine, we're preparing them for to go into barrels in the next month. We're busy racking 2019 wines and I did mention it in one of my previous talks, it's such an exciting time filling wine in a tank and uh, waiting till it's full and then adding a dash of sulfur and then a day later go and taste it. I can't wait to get in the morning to the winery to taste this amazing wines that's been developed over the last 12 months in a barrel. Um, one other thing I can add in, in the UK uh, to our friends and clients in the UK um, at Waitrose where our Sauvignon Blanc 2019 is listed, it's uh, selling at a 25% discount. And of course, that is a great buy now. Friends, today we're talking not of a variety, but uh, more of a few facts on wine faults and questions that people ask. And, um, you know, in a, in a, in a top-class restaurant in Europe and in a few in South Africa, uh, there's a sommelier that will make recommendations. And a sommelier is a wine expert and that have inside knowledge about wine and also the pairing of that with food. And... Um, in Europe, uh, when you make a booking in a Michelin one, two or three star, of course, money is not definitely not a limitation. So uh, you will definitely go according to his recommendation. And this person will make the most amazing pairings with older wines that he or his predecessor bought and mature for years in a vineyard, in most cases underneath the restaurant. And it's such amazing to drink a 10, 15 year old white wine with uh, a sort of one of the the servings that the uh, that the chef prepare. It's it's. I had amazing experiences. Has been privileged to be once or twice or a few times in my life in a Michelin restaurant in Europe. In South Africa, um, there's a few like I mentioned that have the privilege to have a sommelier. But in most cases, a waiter will walk up to the table and bring the wine that the host of the table order. Uh, it's sort of wine etiquette for him to open it in the right way. Uh, and, you know, in the case of a screw top, it's an easy twist off. In the case of a cork wine, you gently pull out the cork and it's quite tricky to work with mature wine. Sometimes the cork crumble because years ago, corks were not treated with silicone and many, many of them shrink and the wine starts seeping past them. And it can be a big frustration pouring your clients a glass of wine and there's a small piece of cork floating on the top. It's really embarrassing. But... Um, you know, if you don't have the privilege to have a sommelier, is to ask the host if, if he's happy with the quality of the wine and if he nod and give you the go-ahead, then you will pour for the people around the table and of course he will top up the glasses 25%. And uh, that's the way of pouring a wine. Now friends, in, in wine faults, there's so many, um, I don't want to scare you, but let's just focus on the three most important ones. And I think the most important one or the, the wine fault that many people refer to is uh, cork taint in the wine. And it is a reality. Uh, there's, much, there's a lot of new technology to improve this, but many times it's frustrating taking a very special of matured wine that you have sentimental value on, um, taking it to a restaurant, you and your friend or your partner or friends, and you've been talking about this wine for a long time and you open it, and unfortunately it's corked and it's a re reality. It's a fungi that's growing in the cork um, and that's with, uh, and people are saying two bottles out of a hundred in the world. Some people are saying up to four bottles. I'm a bit sort of cautious to put figures to it, but uh, it's frustrating. And what's the most scary part is the, the initial start of TCA or as corky flavors in the wine. For many people that just enjoy a glass of wine, it's not, it's not easy for them to detect that. 
and the fruit is gone and the wine tastes different. And uh, yeah, it, it reminds me always of a pack, packet of uh, mushrooms that I open. That sort of earthy flavors remind me of uh, um, TCA. That's the reality and that's why a lot of wineries in the world have moved to screw top closures and I, we had to adjust the chemical composition, the filling height, the CO2 levels of the wine. Another wine fault is um, Brettanomyces, that for many people is even difficult to pronounce, but it's uh, many countries in the world, spe specifically European countries, struggle with Brettanomyces, and some people sold that as a sort of a terroir characteristic, uh, till it was later on determined through analysis that it's got nothing to do with terroir, it's due to high pHs, bad hygiene in the winery, and of course you can enjoy the wine. There was wine sold at huge prices that was con uh, contaminated with Brettanomyces. Um, yeah, and we all in the wine industry is very much aware of it to make sure your hygiene standards, your preparation for bottling, your wine that will go into a barrel, your filtration, your chemical composition is extremely important to make sure that you don't in end up with this yeast and it's a yeast that grow into a dry wine. You know, many people associate the yeast that converts sugar into alcohol, CO2 and flavors. But in this case, it's growing on a dry wine. And what's the sad part about it? If you have a very strong Shiraz, a Cabernet, a Pinotage, a Shiraz, ex exceptional examples of it, and you um, contaminate a uh, spike, like we say, each bottle, Unfortunately, six months later, they will all taste and uh, smell the same, and that's a sad thing. Nothing will happen to you. You won't get sick uh, when you drink a wine that has Brettanomyces. There's also an argument that um, I'm very cautious of making that statement to say a little bit of Brettanomyces can contribute to a wine. I'd rather make sure my wines is Brettanomyces free, but that's just my personal opinion. I'm very uh, sort of focused on that. Friends, and then oxidation, I think that's another reality. Uh, it's very difficult to show you on a video like this, uh, red wine, the color of red wine, but I thought I'll uh, show you three different examples. And uh, its uh, color can definitely give you an indication of the age and the quality of the wine. And in this case here in front of me, I hope I'm going to hold the white sheet here. Uh, you will see the first one is a, a light pale color with a green U in it. It's a 2020 Viewnier. The middle one is a Semillon that I produced for the, in 2007. So it's 13 years old. It's still amazing wine to drink. And the last one, I think you will all agree, have that honey deep straw color. You know, that is 29 years old. It's a Sauvignon Blanc uh, from a different winery. And it's just amazing to show you, you know, in my, in my opinion, this is pale green. This is sort of that mustard, um, you know, some people prefer not to use the word yellow in wine, but rather sort of a straw color, but that mustard yellow straw color. And in this case, I think many people will associate this with a sherry. You will see it's sort of honey, um, deep yellowish, in my opinion, if you allow me to use that word yellow. And this is just due to oxidation. So what happened? Your wine is naturally protected due to its composition. And when I refer to the comp composition, I'm not going to go into depth into this. It's pH and acidity, alcohol, in some cases sugar. Um, and then, of course, there's a small dash of sulfur added to it. Now, friends, in, 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 in sulfur, it's a very controversial subject because if you look at the allowed amount of uh, sulfur added in wine is minute versus fruit juices versus dry fruit and many people complain to say they are allergic to sulfur you know they get a, re a rash in their neck or sweaty or struggle in the night with some um, sort of strange feeling and having a really a dry mouth and a dry throat and you know have the yearning to drink water in a big way or liquid in a bit big way now, just to say sulfur is the culprit is definitely wrong because if that is true, friends, and you drink certain fruit juices and eat dry fruit, then your whole body will be a red rash, if I can make a joke about that. So, in wine, it's highly controlled. And, of course, that also preserves the wine. So, in the first case, in, in, and this is a De Grendel wine, the free sulfur, it's allowed to have 50 parts free sulfur. And just to explain to you the free sulfur, 
is expressed in milligrams per liter. It's added to the wine and that protects the wine. And as you add over the lifespan and the handling of the wine, a certain portion bound that we refer to as a total sulfur, also expressed in milligrams per liter. So the free sulfur is never allowed to be more than 50 milligrams per liter. And as the wine is handled, especially a red wine over years, the total is not allowed to be higher than 150. So in the first case, this is how we will bottle. Our pH is lower and acidity is slightly higher here at the Grendel due to low potassium and cool area, in the potassium in the soil and, and a cool region where we have higher acidities. The free sulfur will be 30. I can assure you in the next one, in the middle one that is uh, 13 years old, the Semillon, there will be no sulfur at all. And of course, maybe just a small portion of total sulfur and friends in the last one that looks like this, immediately the color sort of gives you the indication that there's completely no sulfur in it. So you really need to have a very special palate to enjoy that. And uh, I will not drink it on my own, but uh, maybe with a piece of food or sort of a neutral cheese can work quite well. But let's leave the food pairing. But this is a, a clear example of uh, maturation, uh, aging, and in the last case, oxidation, as simple as that. Um, of course, you know, the, the wine uh, uh, over time, and I did mention it, that corks shrink and wine seep past it. And I can assure you the wine that I opened this bottle and I was so very gently sort of removed the cork uh, because, and of course, the last portion sort of just broke up and I had to put it through a sieve to make sure there's no piece of cork lying on top of it. Nowadays, corks can um, uh, sort of uh, hold up for a longer time because they are protected with uh, and, pre and prevent that they shrink and the wine see past it because due to the thin layer of that you can't really see you can feel it it's slightly sort of um, soft and, 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 and you, if you put your finger across it you can feel there's a layer of silicone that protect the cork from drying out. Guys, just a few questions that people ask and uh, if you talk to a waiter in a restaurant I think or even in a tasting room uh, I think it's quite a general question. People always ask the question, you know, when, what and which wine, at what time must I decant? And unfortunately, there's not a manual to determine, you know, what wine to decant. Because in some cases, the decanting of the wine can really be the end of the wine, especially when it's an old, matured wine and you do it quite aggressive. So, uh, de we in South Africa don't have a decanting culture, but I want to sort of encourage any of you, when it's your <laughs> husband or wife's birthday, that you ask your partner to give you a, a good decanter and start playing around the decan wine at, at different times. If it's a young wine, I think you can open it up, check that it's not corked, rinse the decanter with that bit of wine that you just uh, taste and smell to determine that the wine is not corked. Uh, dump that and then add your wine if it's a wine and, and there's not a golden rule guys. If it's older than five years I very will gently decant it um, on the side and tilt my decanter if it's a young wine. I will open it even four or five hours before the time and decant it quite aggressively by literally you letting it fall into the decanter that it sort of aerate and soften the wine. But please, uh, you can't generalize and say Cabernet must be decanted or Shiraz not or vice versa. You need to play around because of course you get Shirazes made from a vineyard that have from 40 tons a hectare and you have Shiraz that's made from a vineyard at 6 tons a hectare in the composition uh, and the strength of the wine, uh, the strength in alcohol and in sort of composition will determine if the wine can be decanted and it will be a plus for the wine or not. What is the right temperature of serving white wine? The average fridge in South Africa is running between 7 and 8 degrees. If you put a white wine in there, within an hour and 50 minutes, the wine is down to the temperature of the fridge. And if you uh, pour wine as your friends arrive as an aperitif, in my opinion, it's fine to pour it at fridge temperatures. But if you serve it with a starter at 7 o'clock and your if uh, you are quite sort of focused on temperature, guys, take your white wines and please have a choice of wines and make sure there's quite a few de Grenel in the lineup. Um, make sure that you put that uh, sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on your house or your room temperature. Take that from the fridge, open it and let it stand on the side 
and ask your clients or your friends or people that's having a meal with you, what is their first choice and pour that to them. Then the wine will increase from the, the fridge temperature of 7, 8 degrees to around 12 degrees. That's the right temperature of serving white wine. A wine at low temperatures is very difficult. It can be quite a first quencher. Uh, on a hot day at a low temperature but guys you can't really smell a wine at five six degrees or lower so make sure you are in between 10, 10 and 12 degrees if you serve a white wine of course nobody expects you to move around with a meat uh, thermometer and determining the temperature but I think you can use that as a norm on the red wine side according to um, wine etiquette the right temperature is 18 degrees Celsius and uh, you know if you don't have the luxury of an underneath uh, maturing cellar underneath your house and so little people nowadays have that sort of luxury or a big wine fridge and it's a really hot day and you want to impress your friends and serve that with your main course put the wine 40 minutes an hour before serving it let's say at eight o'clock or half by after your starter take it from the fridge leave it for literally 20 minutes in the fridge just to chill it down and if you leave it for half an hour open again, then the wine will come back to 18, 20 degrees Celsius. And, uh, you know, it's nothing more terrible drinking a cold wine. So please be disciplined and set even a clock to say, whoops, my red wine is now 20 minutes in the fridge. I'm going to take it out because if it's cold, it tastes very tannic and hard and astringent. And of course, there's nothing more terrible drinking a red wine at 25, 30 degrees. And we... We must admit in South Africa we live in a hot country, so we must be very much more aware that pe than people in Europe that live in a cooler country. Um, then a question that uh, people that's asked many times is the so-called legs, or referring to the viscosity of the wine. You know, if you swirl a glass like this and you leave it, it's literally the tears. People refer to it as the legs or the tears that run down on the side. And unfortunately, there's many, many stories. Some people even associate that with the quality of the wine. And of course, that's not correct. The purpose of that is high alcohol, is sweetness, and always in the case of sweetness, glycerol. So if this was a noble late harvest or a sweet wine, and I swirl it and leave it, you will clearly see the tears running down on the side. But it's literally just the indication of the viscosity, the, the mouthfeel or the richness that you can expect when you drink this, but it's not necessarily an indication of quality. Friends, if you want to buy some wine online, unfortunately, we are all anxious and uh, desperate to start sending out wines. You can order it on the De Grendel website. And if you are interested in any specific topic, not that I will know everything about wine, but I think I know a little bit, uh, please uh, send us and uh, communicate with us and uh, we will definitely include that if you have a specific question or something that you're interested in, we will love to share it with you. And be patient, be safe, and like I mentioned a few times now in my tastings that I'm convinced uh, that this country, people, the, people in this country is resili resilient and they have a natural sort of protection against this terrible disease. And I'm convinced in the next month or two we, will, we can be sit down with the discipline, distance from one another, without a mask, I hope, and enjoying a great glass of the Grenoble wine. Thanks, thanks for listening. Bye.